Today we're going to talk about war and execution. So just in case you didn't see this yesterday, I wanted to make sure that you saw this image. Um, we're going to see a video clip in a little bit about the guillotine. And you'll be surprised at how long the French continue to use the guillotine. It's kind of uh, disturbing. Anyway, a couple of things that the person that was being executed would have been laid face down um, and the hair cut so that the blade could hit the right spot more effectively. There were women knitters. You can see the explanation for them right here. And um, many people believe that the head stayed alive for about 10 minutes after the fact and that their eyes worked and that they could still smell and hear things, which is kind of interesting. So monarchs and nobles in many other European countries, in particular in Austria and Prussia and Russia, they watched the changes in France with real alarm. They feared that similar revolts might break out in their own countries. And in fact, some radicals were really keen to spread their revolutionary ideas across Europe. As a result, some countries took action. Austria and Prussia, for example, urged the French to restore King Louis to the crown. Let me show you some people and see if they look familiar to you. Just a second here. So this is a Frederick II of Prussia. Um, this area right in here was Prussia. Um, it extended, actually, it was even larger at one time. But this guy, Frederick, is upset. Um, mo maybe partly because the border with France is right there. And then in addition, this is... Marie Antoinette's brother, who is the king of Austria at the time. Austria controls not just like this territory here, but they also control like the Austrian Netherlands. Maybe you remember that from before. Austrian Netherlands is where the king tried to escape to. So um, this is her own brother. So of course he's angry for a couple of reasons. Some countries decided to take action. Austria and Prussia, for example, urged the French to restore Louis to his position. Put the crown back upon Louis's head. The Legislative Assembly responded by declaring war in April 1792. And the war they declared was called the Declaration of Pilnitz. And so the French are going to be in some big trouble here because um, they're not ready for this. I mean, they're not ready to fight a war, and now they're declaring war on two able European countries. The war began pretty badly for the French. By the summer of 1792, Prussian forces were advancing on Paris. The Prussian commanders threatened to destroy Paris if the revolutionaries harmed any member of the royal family. This absolutely enraged the Parisian people. On August 10th, about 20,000 men and women invaded something called the Tuileries. The Tuileries was a palace where the royal family was being held. The mob massacred the royal guards outside the Tuileries and imprisoned King Louis, Marie Antoinette, and their children. Shortly after that, the French troops defending Paris were sent to reinforce the French army in the field. Rumors began to spread that supporters of the king held in Paris prisons planned to break out and seize control of the city. Angry and fearful citizens responded by taking the law into their own hands, and for several days, in early September, they raided the prisons and murdered over a thousand prisoners. Many nobles, priests, and royal sympathizers fell victim to the angry mobs in these, what is called the September Massacres. Under a lot of pressure from radicals in the streets and among its members, the Legislative Assembly set aside the Constitution of 1791. It declared the king completely deposed. Deposed means to completely strip him of power. They dissolved the Assembly, and they called for the election of a brand new legislature. The new governing body, the National Convention, took office in September. It quickly abolished the monarchy completely and declared France now a republic. Adult male citizens were granted the right to vote and to hold office, and despite the important part 
they had already played in the revolution, women were not given even an opportunity to vote. Jacobines take control. Most of the people involved in the governmental changes in September of 1792 were members of a radical political organization called the Jacobin Club. One of the most prominent Jacobin Club members was Jean-Paul Marat. During the revolution, he edited a newspaper called the Ami de Pupil, Friend of the People. In his fiery editorials, Marat called for the death of all of those who continued to support the king. So this is Jean-Paul Marat, and you have a piece of paper that has a little bit more information about him, but like I just said, he was um, an editor of a paper, and he's kind of an interesting guy because he um, had a serious skin condition, really serious skin condition. He was really sickly, and his skin disease made his skin so itchy and, and unpainful that he did his business, like his regular like business writing, in a bathtub. He was born in 1743. He was thin, and he was really good at revolutionary writings. He stirred up a lot of violent moods in Paris. He arranged his bathtub so that he could actually um, have a desk so that he could do writing. And as time went on, he got, got so comfortable in his bathtub that he actually received visitors in his bathtub as well. And this is one of the interesting things about him. So a woman came to see him. A woman named Charlotte one day came to see him when he was in the bathtub. And he agreed to see her. And um, her name was Charlotte Corday. And he, what he didn't know is that she was a supporter of a rival faction of the enemies. And um, and she talked her way into an audience with Marat, pretending to have information that he might want. And she stabbed him. And he couldn't get away because, I mean, he was sitting in the bathtub, for goodness sake. So she fatally stabbed him as he was there in the bathtub. And she ended up um, going to the guillotine for that. Okay, so quick review. We've talked about Versailles. We've talked about King Louis and Marie Antoinette. She got married to King when she was only 14 years old, didn't consummate the marriage for seven years, and then still had four children. We talked about the three estates and how France lacked equity. There was a tennis court oath as the people decided that they were going to finally seize power. And once they decided to seize power and were in trouble with the King, they went to the Bastille and ended up getting weapons there. All that should sound kind of familiar to you. This is John Locke. This is Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Thomas Hobbes. And we've talked about Frederick, the King of Prussia, and the Austrian king who was the brother of Marie Antoinette. Okay, so the Jacobins have taken control and most of the people involved in the governmental changes. Oh, sorry, I already told you that part. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is a little bit more about the guillotine that I promised you. And pay attention to how long the French actually use the guillotine. How did the public find out? Notices were posted around town announcing the time and place. Sometimes the prison would give their version of a press release to the local newspaper with the scheduling information. And sometimes the times weren't announced and crowds would just gather around prison employees assembling a guillotine in the middle of a road. By the late 1930s, guillotine fans earned a violent reputation, much like football hooligans. The prison staff would be forced to assemble their guillotine in the middle of the night, then do the deed early in the morning in the hopes of avoiding bloodthirsty crowds. But it never worked. The guillotine always drew a big crowd. The guillotine is pretty menacing looking. You have to remember the device was a relatively new invention, so it looked unusual. It was designed to be swift, clean, and humane. Its angled metal blade rested high above the crowd for maximum visibility. 
It was an intimidating beast. It was all lean, no filler. The machine's simple design was made up of one very tall, narrow wooden rectangle, sort of like a window frame, except instead of a sliding window pane, it had a large weighted steel blade, which, in theory, would make a clean cut. The head would gently fall into a woven basket filled with sawdust. Sawdust was there to soak up anything. The rest was rolled into a cheap coffin. The efficiency was almost as scary as the mechanism itself. One of the first things you saw was a procession of rickety wooden carts hauling the convicts to the guillotine. During the French Revolution, the guillotine was so refined it could take care of 12 people every 13 minutes. Those carts were always busy. Over time, the guillotine's efficiency improved, primarily due to the efforts of Charles-Henri Sanson, the royal executioner of France during the reign of King Louis XVI, who personally tested the machine on animals and cadavers. Sanson had tested the guillotine for the first time in public on Nicolas Jacques Pelletier. The precision with which Pelletier's dome had separated from his former self pleased Sanson, and the guillotine's use spread. Eventually, the sight of watching French soldiers called gendarmes leave these carts around the city filled with convicted criminals was the signal that the guillotine would soon be following. One eyewitness said, the same carts as those that are used in Paris for carrying wood Four boards were placed across them for seats, and on each board sat two and sometimes three victims. Their hands were tied behind their backs, and the constant jolting of the cart made them nod their heads up and down, to the great amusement of the spectators. The crowds that gathered around the guillotine weren't always rowdy, quite the opposite. It was common for groups of attending women to knit and converse while gathered around the guillotine. Called tricotos, these women initially gathered for local government debates, but officials eventually banned the ladies from public assemblies, so they turned to guillotines for the entertainment factor instead. They even crafted small items in honor of the day's events, including Phrygian caps. Despite their domestic origins, the women became associated with bloodlust and anger as the French Revolution progressed. Tricotos reportedly developed a violent and hateful reputation. The executioner was always the star of the show. He was the guy onlookers focused on. Whether they saw him as a hero or the heel, they knew the headsman was in charge. He was the star point guard. And because the guillotine offered a figuratively hands-off approach to capital punishment, executioners didn't even particularly feel guilty for ending another man's life. Executioners focused on the machine itself rather than what the machine was doing to a fellow human being. They also prepped the guillotine and cleaned up after the event. How's that for humility? Oddly enough, Parisians thought the speed of execution via guillotine removed some of the religious and social connections between death and execution, lessening the spectacle's emotional aspect. The public initially criticized the guillotine for being too easy and clinical. During the use of the guillotine, crowds reportedly yelled, Give me back my wooden gallows! Not always, but sometimes, depending on how many of the condemned were on the day's docket, a person who was about to take the guillotine's angled blade was given the opportunity to say a few last words. Many guillotine victims, but not all, had their last words recorded for posterity. Before his execution in 1793, King Louis XVI gave a speech to the crowd, telling them, I die innocent of all the crimes laid to my charge. I pardon those who have occasioned my death. And I pray to God that the blood you are going to shed may never be visited on France. Officials expected the condemned to remain stalwart in the face of death, but not all abided by this. Louis XV's mistress, Madame du Barry, begged the crowd and perhaps her executioner to give her one more moment. Marie Antoinette, by some accounts, uttered her final words as an apology to her executioner for having stepped on his foot. 